So here we are. Good, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Welcome again and to the new series of the Ipatia Colloquium. Um, it's very, I'm, I hope you are fine and you're doing well, even though we are still under a challenging time, but we are happy and glad to host uh, again, the series dedicated to early career scientists. And, uh, and again, let me congratulate with immediately with all the speakers who were selected again with through a very, very, um, a cha a very uh, I, um, difficult selection process because of the number of large number of applications that we received. Uh, so congratulations uh, for being with us. Uh, thank you for, for the interest uh, for attending the talks. I, um, I immediately show the, so the program of this year. So we have a number of series starting today, every Tuesday, I remember, at, I would like to remind you at 3 p.m. in local time in Gachin, Germany. And then we go up to basically uh, in June, just the last uh, event will be just before the uh, European Astronomical Society uh, Week of Astronomy. Uh, the, the talks are uh, exactly, are two, we have two talks every time. The talks are uh, 30 minutes, 20, 25 minutes long, plus 10 to 5 minutes of quest, time for questions. Um, you can make your question by raising your hand uh, or typing the question in the chat, and then the, the chair will give you the word. Today, we I like to thank the two chairs of today, Belen and, and, and Kevin, who are uh, working at ISO, uh, ISO Chile, actually. So thank you very much for joining us, the fellows, and, and they are uh, actually helping with the chairing uh, of the session. So thank you very much. And uh, I will actually hand over them very uh, quickly. I will hand over uh, the, the word to them. This is just now the, the title and the names of the two speakers of today, but I will let the chat introduce them. Um, I just want to like to mention, as I said, that the participation can be done in two ways. One way you can register using our register. There is a registration page on our Ipatia web pages and where you can put your name and then you will receive the invitation to join us in, uh, within the, 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 the meeting. Otherwise you can attend through the YouTube channel and also people on the chat on the YouTube channel, you are welcome to write, uh, to interact with the, with, the, with the speakers by typing your questions on the chat and then the, the moderator will, the chair of the session will actually uh, pass the, the, the question to the, our speakers. So with this, I think I talk even too much. Uh, I would like to give down the, the, um, the word to Belen for the introduction of the speakers. Thank you very much again. Yeah, thank you very much, Giacomo. And uh, hi, everyone. It's uh, my pleasure to be here today to present um, the first speaker, indeed, of this um, um, second Ipatia Colloquium series. Aim at uh, basically providing a platform where these outstanding early career scientists can talk to us about the, their work. And indeed, we will have today two very great talks, one by Laura Somovigo and another one by Leathered Bugart. So let me introduce uh, Laura first. She's a PhD student for Escuela Normale Superiore. And today she will be telling us about the new method to constrain the dust temperature of high redshift galaxies. So does uh, Laura, please, if you want to start sharing your screen. Yep. And then the floor, the virtual floor is, is, is yours. Thanks. Do you hear me fine? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Okay, do you see my slides full screen? Yeah, that's Okay, fine. so I can start. Should I? Okay. <laughs> so hi everybody, I'm Laura Somovigo and I'm in the last year of my PhD at Scuola Normale Superiore. And today I want to tell you about the work that I've been doing on dust, and in particular, the dust temperature of high redshift galaxies, with a focus on the recent ALMA large program, Rebels, hence the title of my talk, The Dust Temperature Rebels. So let me start by telling you why do we care about dust in the first place. So it comes as no surprise for all of you that the bulk of the emission in galaxies comes from their own stars. However, if we were only to account for stellar emission, we would not be able to actually meet the observations of spectra of local and high-redshift galaxies, 
This is what I'm showing here. So the, the plot that you see is a spectra of a local galaxy, M82. That was, was also the background of my first slide. And the yellow curve that you see is the model prediction if we were to account only for stellar emission. So what happens is that we are missing the data in two ways. First, we have an excess of emission at very short wavelengths, and we are completely missing the emission at very long wavelengths. This is because we are not accounting for dust. Dust grains are a component of the interstellar medium, and basically they are the leftover pollution of previous uh, generations of stars. And what happens is that these dust grains absorb a portion of the UV and optical radiation coming from young stars, get heated, and re-emit this radiation as thermal radiation at infrared and far infrared wavelengths. So let's see the effect in practice. First of all, we have the, the process called extinction, and this is shown by the blue curve that has just appeared. And you see that basically we are reducing the amount of radiation, observable radiation in UV and optical. On top of that, we also have an important emission in infrared and far infrared wavelengths, which is this thermal emission of the heated grains. And you can think of this emission as a black body-like emission. So you understand that the most important properties determining this emission are the dust temperature and the dust mass. Only by accounting both for stars and for dust, we can actually properly describe the spectra of this galaxy and actually meet the data points shown in white. Okay, but the galaxy that I'm showing here is a local galaxy. But one of the coolest things, at least in my opinion of astronomy, is that thanks to the increasingly uh, more precise instruments that we uh, have access to, we, uh, for the first time, we are actually uh, able to also look at the first generations of galaxies in our universe. This has been done um, in the last few years for what concerns the optical and UV radiation, thanks to the Hubble Space Telescope, or HST, with the current observational frontier being set at Redshift 11. You can see already from just a very simple comparison of the two images that I was showing for the local galaxy and the uh, current record holder that the quality of data that we have access to depending on redshift is very different. On top of that, in the last few years, thanks to the advent of submillimeter interferometer arrays such as ALMA, we have also uh, had the first glimpse of the infrared and far infrared emission from these very first galaxies. These observations were really groundbreaking and surprising because before ALMA, it was believed that the first generation of galaxies had a negligible amount of dust in them because they are so young. So they don't have time to pollute themselves and produce so much dust. Nevertheless, we are seeing important infrared emission, so uh, undeniable sign of presence of dust, even in these very first galaxies, leading to one of uh, the puzzles on high redshift galaxies which is how can they be so young, uh, even newborn, and yet so dusty. On top of that, this Christmas, we all received a very nice gift in the form of the James Webb Space Telescope, which really promises to revolutionize our field and make up for some really exciting science in, in the future. So I was mentioning that the highest redshift we go, the more challenges we are facing. And some of, the, some of them, at least the ones that I am more uh, interested in, are summarized in this plot by Liang and collaborators. So here you see the spectra of a low redshift galaxy, where I mean redshift 2. Whereas on this side, you see the spectra of a high redshift galaxy, infrared spectra, where I mean redshift 6. What you see is that for the low redshift galaxy, we have several data points in the infrared, widespread on both sides of the far infrared emission peak. This means that we can easily constrain the dust properties of this source, so both the dust mass and the dust temperature. On the other hand, for the high redshift galaxy, the most commonly used ALMA bands, which are ALMA band 6 and ALMA band 7, only trace the very long wavelength side of the spectrum, where basically the different black body curves corresponding to different dust temperatures are very hard to distinguish. On top of that, especially for large programs such as Alpine and Rebels, which I'm going to discuss in a minute, often have a single continuum data point available corresponding at 158 microns, which is the wavelength of emission of um, an important line, the doubly ionized carbon fine line transition, which is one of the brightest for infrared lines and thus one of the most commonly observed. So in the end, 
The problem is that we don't really know what's the infrared SED shape of high redshift galaxy, so the shape of the spectra, and neither we know the dust temperatures of these sources. And in fact, this quantity is generally assumed a priori in the fitting. Clearly, this creates a problem in the sense that then we are casting huge uncertainties in all the derived properties of high redshift galaxies. First of all, the dust mass, which is dependent on the dust temperature. Consequently, also on the dust production mechanism, since if we don't know what dust mass actually we have in these galaxies, we cannot also uh, really pinpoint which are uh, the available dust production mechanism that can have built up such a dust mass. On top of that, if we don't know the dust temperature, we also uh, cannot really constrain the infrared luminosity of the sources. And consequently, the obscured fraction of the star formation rate in these galaxies which you understand is very important when we are uh, talking about epoch of reionization galaxies, as now we believe that these sources are responsible for this faint phase transition of uh, the universe. In fact, in the last few years, there have been several works concerning the cosmic star formation rate density, which have also suggested that we might have been underestimating the contribution of obscured sources to the cosmic star formation rate density at Ratchified M4. So with these problems in mind, we came up with a new method to derive the dust temperature using a single continuum uh, observation. So this is the formula that we all use to fit the continuum flux per unit frequency. And once that you have fixed the redshift of your source and the dust model that you're interested in, you are left with two unknown parameters, the dust temperature and the dust mass. Our simple idea was to rewrite the dust mass as the product of a dust to gas ratio, which we consider to scale linearly with the metallicity, and a C2 to total gas conversion factor, alpha C2, which is then multiplied by the C2 luminosity. To derive an analytical formula for this uh, conversion factor, we use two well-known scaling relations, the Deleuze relation, connecting the C2 luminosity and the star formation rate, and the kanika smith relation, connecting the gas surface density and the star formation rate surface density. So let me summarize the method again. With one single observation, we can constrain both the dust mass and dust temperature. And we are able to do so because we use the C2 luminosity as a proxy for the dust mass. And then we can use the underlying continuum to constrain the dust temperature. This method has been tested on several local and high redshift galaxies and also on simulations. And in all cases, we recover the same dust temperature obtained with traditional SCD fitting with multiple infrared data points within one sigma. This is shown in the plot here. On the y-axis, you have the dust temperature obtained with our method. And on the x-axis, you have that obtained with traditional acid fitting, and again, multiple data points. The colored area that you see is the area around the bisector plus minus a 30% uncertainty. And you can see that all the sources lay in this area. In particular, I want you to focus on one galaxy, which is uh, ZD1. Galaxy at Rachel 7.15, first observed by uh, Watson, Knudsen, and collaborators. And recently, with Tom Bax, uh, we wrote a paper in which we presented the first ever ALMA band name data for such a high redshift galaxy. These uh, new data allowed us for the first time to really um, scale the peak of the far infrared emission, having information on the shorter wavelength side of the spectrum and constraining the dust temperature of this source to an unprecedented precision. So the important things are that also in this case, we were correct with our first prediction with our method, and also that uh, actually the uncertainty that we were predicting is not that different with respect to the one obtained only with uh, multiple data points on the long wavelength side, which was shown here by this blue dashed curve. So with this new method at our hands, we uh, went and found uh, an equally new sample, uh, even uh, an exciting sample, I would say, to really, to really apply our method on and try to answer to some open questions in our field. The perfect fit was the REBELS sample. REBELS stands for Reunization Era Bright Emission Line Survey. This is an ALMA large program led by Richard Bowens that was recently presented in his flagship paper of Bowen's 2021. And this program targeted 40 of the brightest sources between redshift 6.5 and 9.5, scanning for C2, O3 line emission, and the underlying dust continuum. 
So what I can tell you is that we have several C2 detections and 158 micron con dust continuum detections, allowing us to have the first statistical sample of Regius 7 for infrared continuum detected galaxies. So this is really the perfect sample to try to answer to some questions. For instance, what is the dust content of your galaxies? How do these galaxies build their dust masses? What is the temperature, the dust temperature of your galaxies? And finally, does the dust temperature evolve with redshift? Let me start by introducing you to our sources. These are the rebels galaxies detected both in continuum and in C2. What you're seeing are the uh, ALMA images stacked on top of the HST images. The blue contours are the C2 emission, whereas the red ones are the dust continuum emission. And uh, for each of these sources, we derive their SEDs. You can see them here, color-coded color -coded according to the derived dust temperature obtained with our method. And all the uh, white curves that you're seeing correspond to the median SED, so the median dust temperature and the median dust mass. Let me summarize the results. For the median dust temperature, we find them to lay in the range between 39 and 58 Kelvin. For the dust masses between 0 0.9 and 3.6 10 to the 7 solar masses, which considering that these sources have stellar masses in the range between 10 to the 9 and 10 to the 10, means that we only have uh, to have um, supernova dust yield of uh, below one solar mass of dust per each supernova event, which is consistent with the latest dust, supernova dust production scenario. So we cannot really constrain what is the dust production mechanism for these sources, but we can at least say that the dust masses are pretty compatible with production from supernovae. Let me now move on to the question that I want to focus for the rest of uh, the talk, which is, are we witnessing a cosmic dust temperature evolution? Where does this question come from, first of all? So in the last few years, different groups working on stacked SEDs at low redshift found a very tight correlation between the dust temperature, shown here on the y-axis, and the redshift of the sources, shown here on the x-axis. In particular, the sources that I'm showing here are the one considering the work by Schreiber and collaborators, where he analyzed uh, several stacked SCDs between redshift 0 and redshift 4. He found a linear relation suggesting that the dust temperature increased linearly with redshift. On top of that, um, Thanks to the recent Alma Large program Alpine, people were able to add few points also between RG4 and 6, corresponding to the stacked SEDs of the Alpine sources, which are 120 sources, uh, UV bright sources detected again at 158 microns. So, what people have been doing after this is to try to understand if uh, this relation was still valid at higher redshift. And to do so, they added the few individual sources that we know at redshift higher uh, than five. They are shown here. And what is puzzling and interesting, in my opinion, is that different works have arrived to somewhat clashing conclusions. Richard Bowens himself, which analyzed exactly the data that I'm showing here, so uh, at redshift below four, stuck the SEDs, and then individ uh, sorry below five, and then above five individual sources. He found the linear uh, relation between the temperature and redshift, which is pretty much consistent with the initial suggestion by Schreiber. However, faced Liang and collaborators doing uh, a fit of the stacked SEDs from the fire simulations suggested the different relation with the flattening in the increase of the dust temperature at 35 and 4. What has really been hindering the progress in this sense is the fact that we have very few uh, data at high redshift, so very few galaxies for which we have current dust, uh, avail, uh, reliable sorry, dust temperature estimates, and that the few ones that we have have very large errors and are also scattered uh, all over the place because we have sources as cold as the CMB almost, and instead other sources such as these peculiar galaxies Y1 and YD4, which have dust temperatures uh, above uh, even above 80 Kelvin, which is not observed in the local universe. On top of all of that, there's a sort of elephant in the room that we are ignoring, which is that both of uh, the curves that I'm showing are actually fits either to observations or simulations, but they do not rely on a physical model. So we don't have a physical motivation for a quantitative evolution of the dust temperature with redshift. 
enters Rebels. So the first thing that Rebels can help us with, for sure, is the lack of data at very high redshift, as it's going to allow us to have a fourfold increase in the number of sources known at redshift higher than seven. So the first thing that we can do is to take the plot of the stack the CDs and really trying to compare apples with apples, we can add on top of that the average dust temperature of the Rebels sample, which is around 47 Kelvin. So you can see that this temperature basically sits in between the two relations that I was showing before, meaning that we cannot discard either, but also that neither of them is really describing the data that we are seeing. But we can do something more. We can uh, go and unpack the, both the stack DSDs from Schreiber and now the larger amount of sources that we know at high redshift and compare them one by one. This is what I'm showing here. So the Green triangles that you see are the individual sources whose SCDs were stacked in Schreiber's work. And at high redshift, you can see, first of all, the rebel sources, which are color coded according to their observed uh, 158 micron flux. The other sources that were already known uh, at high redshift on which we have consistently applied our method for the derivation of the dust temperature. And finally, this purple rectangle here, which shows the area where the dust temperatures of the individual alpine galaxies would lay. We have also applied our method to the alpine galaxies and the results will be presented in another upcoming paper of mine. So at this point, uh, looking at the individual data, we see that the situation is becoming a bit more complicated and maybe a simple linear relation doesn't do the job anymore. So we wanted to take a step back and um, really address uh, the elephant in the room that we have been ignoring. So the lack of a physical motivation for the relation. We went back to the basics and said, okay, uh, we can write the infrared luminosity of a galaxy as the absorbed portion of its UV luminosity in a simple, uh, in a simple basically model where uh, the galaxy is a huge cloud. Then we can rewrite the UV luminosity of the galaxy as um, a, a function of the self emission rate and the infrared luminosity as the product of the dust mass in the galaxy and a power to the dust temperature, which depends on the assumed dust model. In our case, it's a power to the six. Now, you know that if we uh, consider a dust to gas ratio, we can basically change this dust mass into a gas mass. So now joining the two sides, we find that the dust temperature is a function of the total gas depletion time in galaxies. So the ratio between the total gas mass and the subformation rate. And this is the most important point because this is exactly where the redshift dependence comes into play. In fact, we know that uh, earlier galaxies have shorter depletion times due to their vigorous cosmological accretion. So in other words, we find that the dust temperature raises with redshift so we can motivate this finding and this is due to the decreasing gas depletion time at earlier epochs. Let me be a bit more quantitative now. This is the relation that we find. So in the end, we have a dependence on one plus redshift to the 0 0.42. And this relation is shown here by this gray dashed curve. So you can see that we are uh, reproducing the data pretty well. However, you can also notice that still the data are wide scattered ar around this relation. And this is because of this second term in our equation, which depends on individual galaxy properties, and in particular, the optical depth to UV, so tau UV, and the metallicity of galaxies. So accounting for variation in these two individual properties, we can also explain the scatter in the dust temperature observed at any redshift. And this is what I'm showing here. We have considered the range of values for both the metallicity and the optical depth, and we were able to cut out this area in the TD versus redshift plot. So from top to bottom, we are moving from uh, lower to larger um, optical depth, and uh, instead from higher to lower um, metallicities. So let me say this again. We have that at any redshift, sources which are more UV obscured and have lower metallicities actually have hotter dust temperatures. We can understand these sentences in a physical sense in a straightforward way. In fact, first of all, if we have larger optical depths, it means that we are much more efficiently absorbing our UV and so more efficiently heating our dust. On top of that, if we have low metallicity, it also means that we have low dust content, 
So for a given UV field, we are expo exposing a lesser amount of dust to it, meaning again, that we are more efficiently heating this dust and attaining larger dust temperatures. So for instance, we can now explain the very hot temperatures observed in Y1 and Y4, pinpointing the individual properties of these galaxies that result in this hot dust. So high UV obscuration and low metallicity. Let me conclude with a summary of our results. Thanks to rebels, we can finally address some of the open questions in our field. First of all, what is the dust content of your galaxies? We find uh, dust masses in the range between 0.9 and 3.6, 10 to the 7 solar masses. Then how do these galaxies build their dust masses? We actually have no conclusive answer on this, which is nice because it means we have something more to work on. But we find that the dust masses that we derive are at least compatible with dust production from super novae. Regarding the dust temperature of your galaxies, we find values in for the median dust temperatures in the range between 39 and 58 Kelvin. And finally, concerning the dust temperature evolution with redshift, we can now motivate the increase of the dust temperature with redshift. We find that it is milder than the inner with a power to the 0 0.4. And we um, connect it with the decrease of the total gas depletion time in early galaxies. On top of that, at any redshift, we can explain the scatter in the observed dust temperature depending on variations on the UV optical depth and the metallicity of individual galaxies. So here is my contact, so my email. If you have any uh, curiosities also offline, please feel free to contact me. And I want to thank again the organizers for giving us uh, the possibility to present our work. So that's all from me. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Laura, for such a <coughs> wonderful talk. I have enjoyed uh, pretty much. I can see people clapping already, at least within the, the Zoom talk. There is some delay with the YouTube channel, but I will start by opening the, the floor for questions. I can see already a, a raise hand. So if you want, uh, first, uh, I can't see your name, but it's R. Riven. Could you open your microphone and ask the question? Yeah. Hello. Sorry that my. Um... Name is not correctly displayed. I, uh, thanks for the uh, talk, Laura, very nice. Thanks. I have a question on the methodology on the third or fourth plot. You calibrated the derived temperatures by comparing to local examples. And um, that was the uh, dust temperatures derived from SED fits versus your method. And in this plot, here it is, you find that the SED fitting have enormous large error passes, one ranging from 20 to more than 120 Kelvin. I think um, the temperatures from the SED fitting on local examples should be much smaller and better constrained. Yeah, sorry, maybe I wasn't clear on this. Actually, the local sources are the green ones here. These ah. gray ones are already high energy sources. So basically this was a completion of all the sources on which we were able to apply our oh. method and there are some available dust temperature estimates. So these yeah. are high energy. These with the really big errors are all the high energy stuff okay. where <laughs> unfortunately okay. we have That's lesser. Thanks yeah. Okay, thank you, Laura. We have another question for, from Leindert. So please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Laura, for this very nice talk. Really Thanks. good results. Um, I actually have a few questions, but I'll just ask one. Um, on for the second part of your talk, when you talk about the dust temperature evolution, yeah. you have a model that's based on the, uh, where you also fold in something like the depletion time. How yeah. well do we know the depletion time evolution all the way out to, say, Richard 8? Well, um, we, don't, we don't know it very well. What we have been doing is to basically connect the depletion time to the accretion time of galaxies. Uh, maybe if you want more details, I have a backup slide on this. And uh, we, when we then used um, the relation that we have in place for uh, the evolution of a redshift of the accretion time of galaxies, which is well constrained by simulations. Then for... Um, Obviously, one could use a different relation for the evolution of the depletion time, such as, for instance, the one uh, provided um, for the molecular gas depletion time from uh, Tacconi and collaborators' work. And that is an empirical relation. So basically, the point is that we don't, maybe quantitatively, we don't know very well how this depletion time is evolving. 
And it might be that we, in the following years, we will update the relation that we have used for the evolution of the depletion time and slightly change this power that we find in the dependence of redshift. But what is the important thing is the qualitative connection. So if the dust temperature depends on the depletion time, and what at least seems um, pretty established is that the depletion time decreases as we move at higher redshift, necessarily the dust temperature is going to uh, increase because it's inversely, inversely proportional. Then how much is going to decrease? That, yes, for sure, we will have better data also thanks to JWST. And it might be that this exact power might change in the future, but that I cannot really, I cannot say. But again, the, the important thing is the connection between uh, the qualitative connection and the fact that in any case, there's a, we are motivating the increase clearly. Yep. Thank you very much. Yep. Okay, so our next question is from Kohei. Sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrongly. Uh, you pronounce correctly, thanks. Uh, so I have one question about uh, dust temperature from the C2 emission line method. If I understand correctly, probably you might also have uh, many O3 detections for your sample, right? Uh, we actually have just two at the moment. I think some data are still being performed. I so, see. yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, the, my question was, you know, how much, uh, how can we use uh, that also emission detections to consider much more better for the dust temperatures? That was uh, my question. So, unfortunately, for the sources, at least to my knowledge, again, the data analysis is still ongoing for that. But to my knowledge, the, the only two galaxies for which they have uh, O3 detection are actually the ones where we don't have the C2. So, okay. unfortunately, we end up not having two data points. Okay. What we could ideally do is to do something similar as what we are doing for the C2 and actually use the relation between O3 and star formation rate and do sort of the same trick for the O3 line emission and the underlying continuum. But unfortunately, the um, correlation between O3 and star formation rate is much milder, especially at high redshift. So it doesn't work as well as the one in C2. Understood, thanks so much. Uh, okay, so I think we have uh, time for a last question. I will jump into one that uh, has uh, appeared in the YouTube channel. It's uh, from Melanie and she says, uh, thank you for the great presentation, Laura. Could you elaborate on the calibration of the alpha C2 factor? Yep. Does it depend on metallicity? What kind of galaxies did you compare to in simulations? Okay, so I actually have uh, a backup slide on this. I'm sorry for uh, the graphics, which is not as nice as the other ones. But so basically, uh, the formula that we find in the end for the C2 conversion factor, uh, we find that maybe I can put it in full screen. Okay, we find that this conversion factor depends inversely on the uh, star formation rate surface density, then on the burstiness parameter. This burstiness parameter is basically the deviation from the Kanikat Smith relation. So when this parameter is larger than one, it means that your galaxy is a star bus, so you have more star formation rate than you would expect from your gas mass. And when it's below one, it means that your galaxy is a quiescent one. So the contrary, you have lesser star formation rate than what you would expect given your gas mass. So there's a dependence on these two parameters. And then on uh, the Y parameter, which is the ratio between the C2 emitting regions extension and the UV emitting region extension. And this parameter is added because um, there's evidence from several works. Uh, I, one on, of all I can, point, I can point you to Carniani 2020, that uh, C2 emission at high redshift is much more extended than the UV one. So these are the parameters on which we have dependence of the alpha C2. The dependence on the metallicity uh, that was mentioned enters in the dust to gas ratio, not in the C2 to total gas conversion factor. And regarding the alpha C2, we have actually, uh, we have actually uh, had the chance to calibrate alpha C2 on data in local galaxies, because for local galaxies, we actually have constraints also on the total gas mass, which is not true for high redshift galaxies where we maybe have constraints on the molecular gas mass, but not on the uh, atomic gas mass. And this is shown here in this plot. So on the y-axis, you have the conversion factor derived from our analytical formula. And on the x-axis, you have uh, the measurement. And you can see that we are uh, pretty consistent. Yes, yeah, so I, I hope this answers the, the question. OK, 
Okay, thank you very much, Laura. I think we are running now out of time, so I will leave you all with uh, Kevin Harrington, who will present the next speaker. Thank you again, Laura, and thank you, Belen. So yes, it's my pleasure to introduce Leiden, Dr. Leiden Bugat. He went to Leiden University for his PhD, which he finished last year. And before then, he was also there for his bachelor's and master's. Now he's a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Heidelberg, and will talk to us all about cold gas in distant galaxies. So feel free to take it away, Leiden. Now you can hear. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Kevin, uh, for this very nice introduction. And uh, also thank you all for coming. Uh, it's a great pleasure to talk to you about my uh, work and some research I've done as part of uh, my PhD and now a postdoc here in, uh, at MPI in Heidelberg. And today I'd like to focus on some recent results we have obtained from very deep news and ALMA observations in the Hubble Ultra Deep field as part of the ALMA uh, large program aspects. And basically what we've learned from this about galaxy evolution focusing on the cold gas in distant galaxies. So to start to zoom out a bit, so the topic of today is galaxy formation. And, and the big question we try to answer in this is basically how galaxies grow and evolve over cosmic time from the very early universe to the present. Now, from a theoretical perspective, there has been tremendous progress in our understanding of this. And this movie that I'll play here, which might lag a bit, but it will get the message across, uh, really shows very well how this works. So here in the center, in the purple, you see a uh, gas accreting onto a central source, onto a dark matter halo, where the galaxy forms. And inside the galaxy, this gas is converted into stars through star formation, driving outflows again. And this cycling of gas is basically the central process to star formation. Now, in this process, there's a lot of physics involved on very many different scales, all the way from the large scales on the cosmic web to the very small scales inside the star forming regions in galaxies. And especially from an observational perspective, uh, this gas supply on the large scales has been very difficult to measure. And this is exactly what we'd like to constrain in order to understand the growth of galaxies over cosmic time. So the central question I want to focus on today are basically where do the baryons reside? Where are the gas and stars located in galaxies? Um, what drives the process of star formation? And I will focus particularly on the cold ISM. How does that evolve over time? Because that is actually what fuels the star formation. So from the operational perspective, we have already put together quite a clear picture, especially around the epoch, um, around cosmic noon, the one to three. And this first plot I'm showing you here, a very familiar thing, which is the cosmic star formation rate density. So the amount of star formation per, per unit volume in the universe. Um, and we know that this evolves from high redshift up to a peak at around redshift one to three, and then declines by a factor eight or so towards the present. Now, if you integrate this curve, you get the total stellar mass buildup, which you can see here on the right. Of course, the measured stellar mass buildup in galaxies in red is slightly lower than the integral, which is the yellow dotted line as not all the mass stays in stars. Stars also go supernova, drive winds. Um, but we know how mass in galaxies builds up observation. If we now focus on the gas, we can first look at the atomic gas. So here you can see the evolution of the density of H1. And it's been known for about a decade or so now that the H1 actually does not evolve very strongly. It maybe declines by a factor two or so between redshift four and zero, um, but not very much more. But of course, the key missing ingredient here is the H2 density which actually is directly linked to the star formation which you see in the top left. And understanding how this is shaped can actually tell us something about the global average star formation. For example, um, if it would look something like this, so it basically goes up and down as the star formation density does, this suggests that the um, increased star formation is just driven by the increased amount of gas. Instead, if it would look very flat, then um, maybe the increasing uh, star formation is actually not driven by the gas supply, but just by the fact that more stars can be formed from the same amount of gas, so an increased star formation efficiency. So I already told you, cold gas is the fuel for star formation, and you can beautifully see this, and we can, especially the nearby universe, beautifully image this with telescopes for like ALMA, which you can now see here on the right, really probing the molecular clouds in a nearby spiral galaxy. Um, but what you're seeing is not directly the H2, because we have to use tracers to probe the H2 that is itself invisible. And the most common tracers we use are carbon monoxide, which is really the golden standard, but also dust continuum emission and fainter atomic and molecular species, which are harder to observe at high Z, but together these can give us 
uh, a measure of the actual molecular gas, which uh, so the H2, which dominates in mass, but is very difficult to constrain observation. Now, from target surface, we have already learned quite a bit about the gas fraction in galaxies. So this is a, a more recent compilation from, uh, from the Alpine survey, and it shows nicely that out of redshift of three or so probing where the gas is probed with CO, we see that the amount of gas compared to the stellar mass actually increases by quite a significant fraction. And now with ALMA, we are also improving this into increasing high redshift here in red with C plus with Alpine. Uh, Laura already talked about rebels, which would even fall off the right of this plot. Um, but all these surveys that are showing this um, have been based on galaxies that are pre-selected by the UV to far infrared properties. And in that way, they give an incomplete picture of the total galaxy population. And this is where um, our research comes in, where we actually do spectral scan surveys to actually map a total part of the sky in order to constrain the molecular gas content. So these spectral scan surveys in deep fields, molecular deep fields, are made to really um, take a census of the cosmic molecular gas density. And in that sense, they're complementary to surveys that focus on particular galaxies. And these are now only really possible due to the fact that we have these deep fields like Hubble to deep field and other deep fields where we have extensive multi-wave information and interferometers like ALMA that have incredible uh, sensitivity in order to probe it. So after several pilot programs, this has now culminated in a, an ALMA large program, the first ectogalactic ALMA large program called ASPEX, which was geared to do it, doing this. So ASPEX is the ALMA spectroscopic survey and the Hubble to deep field. And it was uh, 250 hours in uh, UDF and was designed to provide such an inventory of the cosmic molecular gas and dust, dust content. And the way that ASPEX does this is by scanning through two complete ALMA bands, ALMA band three and six. And in that way, you basically detect the line emission from the uh, CO emission and other species as they redshift through the band and take a complete census of the emission. So it's really a flux limited survey of gas emission. But the area that was targeted is exactly in the deepest part of the UDF, which you can see here on the spot on the right. And um, this gives us a very well-defined cosmic volume, and at the same time, also a wealth of multi-wavelength data on all the sources that have been detected. And one um, piece of multi-wavelength data that has been very important to us has been the very deep MUSE integral field spectroscopy from ESO's MUSE instrument, which basically gave us redshifts for over 10 times more galaxies in this field than were known prior to the MUSE observations. And the reason that this field was also chosen is, of course, that it will remain a prime target also for JWST in the future. So it has a great legacy value as well. All right, so Aspects was led by uh, three PIs, Fabian Walter, Manuel Evela, and Chris Carilli, together with a global team of people around the world. Um, Aspects is actually done. So we had an international press data release a little over a year ago now, and you can find all the data and the cubes and images and tables online on our website, aspects.info. And you can also there look up all our papers. Uh, of course, I won't have time to talk about all of them. So please look there for other topics. And um, for the remainder of this talk, I will really focus on the cold gas emission. Um, but let's jump into the data. So here you can see the data cubes that were produced by Aspects in UDF at 3 and 1.2 millimeter on the left and on the right. And these are the signal to noise cubes. And even without doing any analysis, you can immediately see the galaxies that are emitting in CO. So these are the, the blobs that jump out of the cube. Um, I'm not sure how well they are visible on your screen, but if you get close, you will see them. And the brightest sources in the field, which we can immediately detect. And the left in CO and in the right, you can also see some other things. You can even see the brightest sources streaking in the dust continuum through the cube. Um, now, in fact, if we collapse the cube on its frequency axis, we actually get an image of the dust continuum. And this is what you see here for the 1.2 millimeter cube. And this is an extremely sensitive image because we have very large frequency coverage, actually uh, the deepest uh, dust image we have at 1.2 millimeter. And this really shows us also which galaxies in the UDF are very bright in their dust emission, giving some key additional information to measuring their cold gas mass. Now, for the remainder of this talk, I'll focus on the topics which I worked on myself um, together with all the other people in the team. And, um, which were also part of my PhD thesis, which I completed last year. And starting with a very simple question, when you do a flux limit survey, what are the galaxies that you actually detect the cold gas? And secondly, um, what are the ISM conditions in these sources? And these are very important because we need them to actually measure the gas masses. So thirdly, I'll go into how the molecular gas density then evolves and finally put it all back into the picture I sketched at the beginning, uh, linking it to the variance cycle of galaxies.
But let's start at the top. So when you do a flux limited survey, what galaxies do we actually see in the UEF? So here are the uh, postage stamps of the brightest sources in the field. Uh, you can see the HST image with the CO counters on top. And what immediately stands out is that we actually find a very diverse morphology of sources. Uh, we find isolated sources, sources in groups. Some of them are spiral, disky like galaxies. Some of them are very blobby. Um, because it's the UDF, we actually have counterparts for all the sources, so we know them uh, because the imaging is so deep. And they range uh, between a redshift of one to four, or, um, or roughly. And because of all the imaging, we have also very good measurements of their SED, and we can measure their star formation rates and stellar masses. So if we put them on the well-known um, stellar mass and star formation rate diagrams, uh, which I show you here, and this is what people also tend to refer to as the main sequence of star forming galaxies, we see that we are picking up galaxies which are on the bright end of the galaxy main sequence and above, and actually also below. Um, so we're really picking up the average star forming galaxies at these epochs uh, in their molecular gas signal at the mass event. Now, the bright galaxies above the main sequence are not, are of course, uh, easily detectable. But what's very interesting is that we're also seeing some sources that actually fall below this relation. And this is uh, very good because these were typically the kind of sources that you would not observe in a um, pre selected, uh, in a targeted survey where you select by the star forming properties. But they can still contain significant amounts of gas. And these are now taken into account as well. So now that we know that what kind of galaxies detect, the next thing to look at is what are their ISM conditions. And their ISM conditions are quite important um, because they actually uh, set the boundary conditions for the star formation in the galaxy. So uh, they set the boundary conditions for the clouds out of which the stars form. But also they're very important for the survey itself because they're actually a key ingredient to invert, convert the observed emission into a gas mass. Um, with, because the conversion factors are actually dependent on the conditions of the gas, such as the metallicity, the temperature, and the density, et cetera. And just to illustrate this here on the plot on the right, you can see what we call the a CO ladder. So on the x-axis, you see the rotational quantum number of the different CO transitions at higher um, quantum level uh, plotted against the flux density that comes out. And as, as gas gets warmer and denser, here I'm showing you increased density as a fixed temperature, the higher levels of CO will be increasingly excited. So if we want to infer um, the gas mass from CO, which is calibrated to the ground state, from a higher J transition, we actually need to know this excitation. It's actually quite important. And as we probe different lines at different redshifts, um, this is one of the key ingredients that we need. Um, and of course, um, with that, we can also now compare how the conditions at uh, cosmic noon change compared to local galaxies. And this actually tells us something about the process of star formation itself. So to probe the conditions, um, we can make use of also the multi-wavelength data first. So uh, I already mentioned that we have very deep new spectroscopy. And this we can use to actually measure the metallicity in the spectra, especially at the lower redshift sources. Um, so here I'm plotting our galaxies at redshift one to two again, now on the mass metallicity relation. And what you see is that they all fall on the massive end of the mass metallicity relation. So they have metallicity, which is roughly solar. And this is key because that actually supports the use of galactic conversion factors that have been well calibrated locally in order to measure their molecular gas masses. Um, Next, we can use the full data from the aspect survey, so all the multi wavelength data, uh, to look at their uh, multi line data to look at their CO ladders. And this is what I'm showing you here now. So, uh, this is now the actual uh, modeled CO ladders for all the sources in the aspects field, color coded by the redshift. And the first thing that you can see is that there actually is quite a variety in the CO excitation in these sources. Um, the galaxies typically show excitation that is greater than that of the Milky Way. The Milky Way does not have very large excitation, but galaxies. Have um, cosmic noon typically do so, um, but it's actually not true in all the cases as previously suggested. So uh, whilst galaxies cosmic noon can have more warm and dense gas, it's actually not always the case. So it's not an omnipresent feature of these galaxies. What's perhaps more interesting is that if you compare the yellow curves here to the darker colored curves, um, which is then the high redshift sources to the low redshift sources, we see that the galaxies at high redshift actually have intrinsically larger excitation than the sources at lower redshift. 
And naively, one might think this is actually a, a result of the flux limit of the survey. We just pick up brighter galaxies at high redshift. But we actually have the volume to also detect sources with high excitation at lower um, redshifts, and we really do not see them. So what we think we are actually seeing is an intrinsic evolution of the excitation, such that galaxies that are at redshift 2 to 3 have intrinsically higher excitation at galaxies at redshift 1 to 2. Now, one thing that could be driving this is AGN activity, but we do not think it's the case because that would be mainly dri driving the higher JCO lines. So what is more likely is that we're actually seeing the effect of um, the galaxies at redshifts uh, 2 to 3 being more highly star-forming and more compact than the galaxies at redshift 1 to 2, and this driving increasing radiation fields and higher surface densities of star formation rate in gas in these galaxies. Um, and this, so this is a very interesting new result, and it's also something that's key uh, that we will certainly follow up in order to determine uh, what is driving this evolution in excitation. But the next step is to really push this out to higher redshift. So with aspects, we are mainly probing galaxies between redshift one to three, but again, due to the wealth of the MUSE data, we can actually also study galaxies at higher redshift by using the MUSE redshift as a prior information. So this is what we did next. Um, so at redshifts greater than three, we typically detect galaxies in MUSE via their Lyman alpha mission. And this is actually not probing um, the rest, uh, rest frame of the galaxy. Uh, so therefore, I led a, a KMOS and MOS fire survey of all the bright Lyman alpha emitters in, uh, in the UDF uh, um, in order to detect their systemic redshift. Um, and then we went back to our aspects data cube and tried to measure their molecular gas mass. And you can see the stack of the CO emission here on the left. Uh, it looks very non-impressive uh, because there was actually a non-detection. And this actually, uh, naively, this would actually be very surprising because this stack is actually pretty sensitive. But if you think about it a bit longer, it actually makes sense because by the time you hit redshift three and a half, uh, these typical galaxies actually um, have relatively low metallicity because if you think about the evolution of the mass metallicity relation, uh, galaxies at redshift three and a half still have uh, significantly, that are on the mass metallicity relation still have significantly subsolar metallicities. And this actually drives up uh, the conversion factors quite strongly. It's quite difficult to detect gas mode low metallicity. So, what this is telling us now is that above a redshift of three and a half or so, it's actually quite challenging to detect the cold gas in typical galaxies through CO. And we really have to think about alternatives in order to do this. All right, but now that we know our sources, we've characterized them, and uh, we know what we are, we know how to measure the gas masses. We can look to the um, really the core result that we try to measure with aspects, which is the evolution of the cosmic molecular gas density. And this is what I'm showing you here now on this plot. Um, so the red boxes are aspects, and the other uh, data points are uh, similar surveys that have accumulated over the same time. And together, these are now really showing us a picture that reminds us of the star formation rate density. So we see that the Molecular gas density is um, increases from high redshift up to a peak at around redshift one to two, and then declines towards the present. And this is, to some extent, a very similar evolution to the cosmic to the star formation rate surface density, um, which suggests that on the globally averaged, the depletion times do not vary very strongly. And then just to put this back now into the big picture, um, if we put this plot here on the plot that I started with and replace it. You can see this a bit better, um, indeed, that the shapes are very similar, uh, suggesting roughly constant depletion times. But now that we have this picture put together, there's actually several interesting things we can do. And I just wanted to highlight one uh, very, uh, I think, one, one key result that comes out of this. Um, and that is that we can, if we take a very simple model of gas flows, where we say the gas flows from very large distances into the H1 reservoir, then from the H1 reservoir into the H2 reservoir, and then into the stars, we can follow the net gas flows. And here, um, I'm showing you the mass densities again as a function of redshift, now uh, all put together. And if you look at the total mass of stars that is gained between, say, redshift 1.5 and redshift 0. So this is the increase in the red curve. Uh, this is significantly larger than the amount of gas that is lost in H2. Note this is a log-log plot. Um, and this immediately tells us that the H2 reservoir at redshift 1.5 is not sufficient to sustain the star formation rate all the way to redshift 0, and that accretion of gas into the H2 reservoir must have taken place in order to sustain the star formation. And uh, I wouldn't have time to talk about this now, but uh, by doing this, uh, we can also actually constrain these accretion rates, making various assumptions about the models. 
But putting it all together now, we, we have now a census of all the baryons inside galaxies. And the black line actually shows you the sum of the different components, the stars, the gas. And what you see is that this is significantly below the cosmic baryon density. So this tells us that the amount of baryons in galaxies is actually significantly smaller than the... Um, so to put it the other way around, most of the baryons are actually outside of galaxies and not inside galaxies. All right, just to briefly pause and wrap up some conclusions uh, up to this point. So I hope I've shown you that with aspects and the work that we've done, uh, we actually, with all the news and HST, we really have a unique view on the physics of cold gas and star formation at high redshift. And that with these spectral scan surveys, we can now probe uh, the cold ISM of typical galaxies and intermediate redshifts. Um, some interesting results that came out of this is that we're actually seeing a range of conditions in their ISM at a fixed redshift and also some ev evidence for the fact that there might be an evolution in the conditions with redshift. Um, furthermore, I showed you that pushing this to high redshift will actually be challenging because the low metallicity of typical star forming galaxies at, the, uh, at redshift greater than three make observations of cold gas and CO very difficult. By putting the cosmic molecular gas density in place, we actually are now really moving towards a more complete picture of the cosmic baryon cycle. And um, one of the things that um, this tells us is that, uh, or one of the things that we see from this is that the rise and the fall of the star formation rate, surf, uh, star from, cosmic star formation rate density can actually be very naturally explained by the rise and fall of the cosmic molecular gas density. And combining this, one of the things that uh, we can see is that we really need a creation of fresh H2 gas into galaxies in order to sustain the stellar growth all the way out to redshift zero. Now, just to conclude um, and put some future perspectives. So we have uh, from aspects and uh, the surveys that have been, similar surveys that have been done recently, we now really have the first constraints on the cosmic molecular gas content, uh, cosmic molecular gas content. But this is still greatly averaged over space and time. So we're really averaging over the entire galaxy population. And at the same time, the accuracy with which we can do this measurement is very much limited by our knowledge of the physical conditions. So to take some next steps, we really need larger areas and samples on current and future submillimeter interferometers. And I just wanted to show you some first steps that we are taking now. So one of the things is that we are pushing this to larger areas. So we're doing a survey now called Wide Aspects. Um, that really is aimed at probing the bright end of the CO luminosity function, so really the, the, the brightest galaxies, in order to, and over a larger area, in order to uh, better constrain the cosmic variance in the result and also see if we can uh, detect the clustering of the CO emitters. So this program has been ongoing. It was reapproved for cycle eight, and actually I just got all the observations in over Christmas, so uh, hopefully we'll be able to present some results from this soon. And on the other topic of the conditions in the ISM, I think this is actually one of uh, still a big open question for ALMA's Origins of Galaxy Science Goal. And uh, I think we really need to invest all the time uh, both in high resolution follow up of sources so we can study the surface densities of gas and dust, but also need systematic studies of multi line and uh, continuum emission in order to really constrain the gas uh, properties. So for aspects, um, I'm working on an ongoing program to follow up basically all the multi line emission we can get with ALMA. And at the same time, we're developing um, new models to jointly model the line and continuum emission in order to constrain the temperature intensities of the gas. Um, and I think this is really key in order to make progress in, uh, in our determination of understanding cold, um, star formation and uh, cold gas in distant galaxies. Of course, we have several exciting developments coming up in the near future for this. Uh, NOEMA is continuously being upgraded with uh, the correlator upgrades, has been getting an additional dish for more sensitivity. ALMA, the band one and two receivers, will really help us probe in more of the low J transitions at the high redshift. And also the NGVLA further down uh, will really also greatly improve the sensitivity with which we can do these measurements. And at the same time, we're also very excited for what we can learn about the galaxies we detect in gold gas themselves. So JWST has been successfully launched, which really gives us a unique view on the, on the, star, on the stellar mass and star forming properties of these galaxies. And then with the ELT, um, later this decade, that we will greatly study the kinematics and also the uh, co-evolution of the galaxies in the black holes. And in that sense, I think there's a very bright future for the study of, uh, of the galaxy evolution at Cosmic Moon. Thank you very much. Excellent, Landon. Thank you so much. So we have time for a couple of questions. We started a little bit uh, shifted, so we have time for a couple of questions. 
as people think. Uh, Landed, I had a question. So you had some X-ray detected AGN. Could you comment on the CEO SED for that source compared to another source, say at a fixed similar redshift? I think you're muted. Sorry, yeah, I was saying, yes, I can. And I can actually show you the SED of some of the individual sources, which I did not um, show you in the talk. I uh, just need to find the slide in my backup slides. Um, if I brought it, well, I can also show you here. So the, the, the answer to this question is, uh, it's not very uh, statistically significant. Um, so what we're seeing um, is that the AGN do not have excitation that really stands out very strongly compared to the uh, to the other sources. So the brightest source in the survey is an AGN and has quite high excitation, but there are some other sources that have actually, especially Roger one to two, for which the low J and mid J excitation actually does not really stand out compared to the other sources. Um, and I think this may be also not so unexpected as. Um, Typically, we only see the influence of the, the really hard um, BDRs and XDRs in the higher J, um, so basically J above eight or so uh, part of the ladder. And especially globally integrated, the ladder is really dominated by the, the, the overall um, emission from the galaxy. So I think if we look at higher J transitions, we might see this. In the lower J transitions, we do not see this very strongly. OK, thank you. And I see a question from uh, Kohei. Yeah. So I have one question about uh, total mass budget as a function of rate shift. Uh, so could you go back to that slides? Oh yeah, for example, this one. Uh, I have one question. Uh, if we look at H2 density, so we see an increasing of the density from rate shift four to around range to 1.5. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the main mechanism of increasing of the density? And then why do we see a decline about that? Right. So the, so the main, I think the main, um, it's a very good question. Um, so I think what we're seeing is basically we're the buildup of, we're seeing just the buildup of galaxies um, getting bigger and larger and accumulating more H2 gas in their reservoirs all the way up to basically the peak of cosmic star formation, where the galaxies have most of the gas and most of the peak of the star formation. And after that, um, the gas basically after the peak of cosmic star formation, uh, there the galaxies just reduce their amount of, of H2, and that's why also why the star formation rate declines. So I think we're really seeing the effect of the gas accretion at high redshift up to this peak, and then um, the suppression of the further accretion such that the reservoirs of gas slowly decline again, at least on average, of course, um, and therefore also the star formation rate. Does that answer your question? I see, I understand. So the main mainly is you know the stellar mass build up before and after latest for one is completely different. That, uh, yeah, and the gas accretion. I yeah, think, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. I see. Thank you very much. Or at least okay, that's okay. So I don't sorry, Landon. Were you gonna say something? Please go ahead. Okay, no, I was just gonna mention I don't see any further questions at this point. Uh, maybe I can check the, the chat. Okay, so it looks like that's it. And this was the first of the Hypatia Colloquium. So definitely come back the next Tuesdays up until June. So thank you once again to both of the speakers. And Giacomo, would you like yes, to close? thank you very up? much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, Belen for, for chatting the session. Thank you to Laura Leintert indeed for the excellent talks. Congratulations. And please remember that is for the speaker and for everyone, there will be a proceedings, collection of proceedings. Uh, we will publish the proceeding at the end in, in, in June, but you know, to, for the speakers, please remember to, <laughs> to write the proceedings uh, because this is going to be published now. People can already download the proceeding last year from our pages. Uh, you can see the contribution of all the speakers, and they are also available on ADS and published on Zenodo, so you can download them and cite them. This is great work, and today we saw this how beautiful work and great work is done. So thank you very much again. Congratulations, and and see you next Tuesday. Thanks, bye. Thank uh, you. Well, Take bye, care. Bye, bye. See you. Thanks, Giacomo. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye.